but in the in the interest of time, because um, we do have a very full agenda, uh, going to get started today. Um, welcome to the second Sustainable Coffee Dialogue hosted by USA Green Invest Asia and the Global Coffee Platform. Uh, this is the second of a series of webinars to be held over the next year. Uh, the focus of the series is on low carbon coffee production through improved land use. Uh, through this series, we aim to raise the awareness and capacity of coffee buyers, suppliers, and producers uh, to contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the coffee supply chain and respond to the challenges of climate change. Uh, we had over 300 people register for today. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily expect that everybody will join, but I do want to note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to those who may not have been able to join us today. Uh, we are also offering Vietnamese uh, simultaneous translation for today's event. If you are more comfortable listening in Vietnamese, uh, please find the interpretation button on the Zoom bar and select Vietnamese. If you are a Vietnamese speaker and would like to ask a question, please write it in Vietnamese and we'll get it translated into English. Okay, the next slide, please. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Christy Owen, the Chief of Party for USA Green Invest Asia. I'm based in Bangkok, Thailand, and I have the honor to work with a team of professionals uh, dedicated to reducing carbon emissions due to land use change through increasing private sector investments and partnerships with the private sector uh, that support sustainable business models across Southeast Asia, including those in the coffee sector. Uh, we have a full agenda plan. And before we get started with our first speaker, I wanted to take a couple minutes to go through this, uh, the agenda and a few housekeeping items of how this event will uh, run today. <clears throat> so uh, as you see the agenda here, after welcome remarks from the Global Coffee Platform and USAID's Regional Devel Development Mission for Asia, we'll have our first session featuring an overview on carbon emissions and sequestration in coffee uh, systems to set the scene for today's webinar uh, and that will be from USAID's Green Invest Asia's Senior Agriculture, Forestry, and Other Land Use Advisor. Uh, following this overview, we'll have a short presentation to review the results of a national baseline study on fertilizer usage in Vietnam, uh, and then a panel discussion with three guests from Sirad Siat, Ecom Trading, and Sophie's. Afterward, we'll pause for a few minutes uh, for Q&A. So please remember uh, to only use the Q&A function for your questions. That will help us manage the questions and make sure we get to them. Our second session will focus on intercropping strategies to diversify coffee farms uh, with a look at profitability and enhanced carbon storage. Uh, this session will be moderated by IDH uh, with panelists representing ECRAF, uh, Chaibo GmbH, and Olam. I will again take time for a few questions before asking for key takeaways from today's uh, session from Classic Beans Cooperative and Louis Dreyfus Company. Prior to closing the webinar, uh, we'll ask you to participate in a quick poll. It'll be done through Zoom and very simple three questions. And I'll provide some more guidance on how to do that when we get to that point in the agenda. Uh, again, if you have a question for the speakers, please write it directly into the Q&A box. And I, along with the panel moderators, will do our best to, to get your question answered during the webinar today. So if you could have the next slide, please. And the next one. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Galka Butrago, the deputy, or excuse me, the director of programs and corporate partnerships for the Global Coffee Platform to provide a brief uh, welcome remark. As a trained economist, Ms. Butrago has years of experience supporting policy, advocacy, and monitoring and standards for improved sustainability in the coffee sector. She is based in Bonn, Germany. So Galka, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christy, for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. It is really my pleasure to welcome you all to the second webinar of the Sustainable Coffee Dialogue Webinar Series. For those of you who are not familiar with the Global Coffee Platform, the Global Coffee Platform um, is a membership association that includes uh, members along all the segments of the supply chain from farmer to roasters that are united uh, behind advancing sustainability in the coffee sector. 
And we also work with a network of country platforms in coffee producing countries that strive to address the most critical sustainability challenges. And therefore, as an association, we're really happy to have partnered with USA Green Invest Asia to run this dialogue series. Sharing information, sharing knowledge and learnings is a first step to, to, to foster industry collaboration to decarbonize coffee production in this case, and to expand pre-competitive collaboration in, within our industry and in other regions. So in early October, we launched, we launched the full um, series and we had our first session convening um, coffee actors to collaborate on reducing greenhouse um, gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And it was very encouraging to see um, all the attention and the participation and the interest in, in the conversation. Um, and for me, one of the key highlights was collaboration over competition. I think this message highlights the importance that the work at pre-competitive level has as a key ingredient for impact at scale. And even if the session was only a couple of weeks ago, there have already been important developments in the climate and sustainability landscape. So we have had the results of COP26, where we had important global commitments, but we know that they fell short in addressing the challenges that we're facing. More recently, we had the European Union announcing legislation that forces companies to prove that the products um, they sell, including coffee, have not contributed to deforestation. So to ensure that all these global commitments and policy dialogue actually results in tangible benefits that go in the right direction, they need to be really anchored in the realities of the producing countries. And therefore, this session today is very important. We're gathering to discuss how improved land use practices can deliver low carbon production. We're going to have a closer look at practices like agric regenerative agriculture and intercropping and see the connection they have with profitability, productivity, soil health, and carbon sequestration. And also very importantly, how they can be scaled up. You may see from the agenda that the organizers have made a great effort to bring a really wide variety of voices from the private sector, Vietnam, Indonesia, practice-oriented organizations, research. And we hope that these discussions will catalyze innovation and collaboration across the different segments of the coffee supply chain. So a warm welcome to all of you, to the panelists and the participants, and we hope that you enjoyed this webinar, you find it insightful and useful to continue advancing towards low carbon coffee production sector. Thank you. Thank you, Delka. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, good remarks, and I appreciate you providing a bit of a summary of what happened uh, in the last uh, webinar. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, move to the next slide, please. And I'd like to introduce our second speaker, for some introductory remarks, uh, Ms. Rupa Karya. After beginning her career working on forest conservation and community development in Thailand and Vietnam, uh, Rupa has returned to the region and serves as the deputy director of USAID's regional, Asia Regional Environment Office based in Bangkok. Uh, during her time with USAID, she has led programs on climate change, biodiversity conservation, combating wildlife crime, transboundary ecosystem management, and environmental governance. Uh, before joining USAID, Rupa worked with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So Rupa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. And thank you, Galka, for setting the tone for what we hope will be yet another interesting and, and very thought-provoking event. So it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the second Sustainable Coffee Dialogue. Um, I currently am the Deputy Director of the Asia Regional Environment Office for, for USAID, and we are so proud to support this series in collaboration with our partner, the Global Coffee Platform. So before this first dialogue was held um, in October, organizers surveyed leaders in the coffee industry to learn their main sustainability concerns, and regenerative practices surfaced as a common priority. As a result, today we've helped curate a strong lineup of experts from soil to systems to share climate smart practices for more sustainable supply chains. And what's really striking about this industry is how many alliances already exist to improve that chain, starting foremost with our co-host, the Global Coffee Platform. A number of participants today likely belong to other initiatives, including the Sustainable Coffee Challenge, the International Coffee Partners Initiative for Coffee and Climate, the International Coffee Council's Public-Private Task Force, to name just a few. 
So my question to this group is, with all of these pooled resources, shared knowledge and joint strategies, has it altered coffee production, trade and consumption enough for you? And why or why not? Going into this second dialogue, I encourage you to consider how we can all raise the bar on coffee-led climate action. And no doubt, there are inspiring testimonies of how individually and collectively we are seeing the needle of progress inch forward on the sector's environmental and social sustainability. However, it's also likely that the further you proceed on the sustainability journey toward low carbon, resilient coffee production, the more you realize how much further there is to travel. Low international coffee prices have stymied sustainable coffee production. It's hard to align different business interests and power among collaborators. Often there's not enough resources to plan for long-term sustainability programming, and there's still a gap in industry investments to meet those ambitious agendas for coffee sector transformation. It's one thing to understand the challenges, but it's another to coordinate on actions, roles, responsibilities, and who pays for what. So for my agency, USAID, and our new climate strategy, a central goal is the reduction of carbon emissions, especially through agricultural commodity supply chains and in partnership with business. Through our project, USAID Green Invest Asia, we are advising both coffee buyers and suppliers sourcing from nearly 1.5 million hectares of land in Vietnam and Indonesia on ways to measure and cut carbon emissions at the farm level. And that work builds on a long history of USAID funded research and fieldwork in the coffee sector, most recently through the Alliance for Resilient Coffee, as well as the work of the other platforms I mentioned earlier. So for coffee to meet our ambitious goals, the arc of climate action must be very long and very wide. There are over 12 million coffee farms worldwide. So the impact of your sustainability decisions, your investments, your actions through your organizations and through the platforms that you participate in, it needs to ripple pretty far and pretty wide to influence land use. And I think now is a really good time for us to be having these conversations. Um, as was mentioned at the latest UN climate change conference, COP26, over 100 countries made the commitment to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. And that declaration includes implementing and redesigning agricultural policies and programs to incentivize sustainable agriculture, promote food security and benefit the environment. So that pledge, it, it reaffirms the real need for the public and the private sector to work together to push for a sustainable land use transition in agriculture and in major commodities like coffee. And I think transformative shift can, can sound very cliched, but as COP26 reminded us, that's what's needed. Nothing less than a transformative shift in how industry operates. And we've all seen in our work, that's absolutely possible. My experience working on these issues over three different continents, it's taught me that radical shifts can absolutely happen through incremental, persistent, committed and concerted efforts, coupled with adequate investment and ample vision. And of course, lots of good coffee can help. So during this transition to a more climate resilient and low emissions coffee ecosystem, USAID will continue to be a catalyst and your partner. Today's discussion is just one part of a much longer narrative about the future of coffee, which you are all helping to write a process um, we at USAID are very proud to support. Thank you all. Thank you, Rupa. Um, great reminder of, of what it's gonna take, but also the element of, uh, of hope and optimism that we need to energize us to move forward. Um, so next, I'd like to get to our first uh, session around uh, with starting with an overview of uh, carbon emissions and sequestration in the coffee systems. Um, to start us off, uh, if we go to the next slide, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Barry Flaming, who is the Senior Agriculture, Forestry and Other Land Use Advisor for USAID Green Invest Asia. He is a forester by training. Um, but Barry leads the engagement and technical service delivery to private sector partners uh, with uh, USA Green Invest Asia. He brings his diverse experience spanning the private, public, and nonprofit sectors uh, in the design and implementation of natural resource management, forestry, ag, biodiversity conservation, and climate change programs uh, for the benefit of advising uh, companies that we work with, as well as investors, and in, effect in effective strategies for sustainable land use management. 
So Barry, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Uh, great, thank you, Christy. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. Um, so to help guide our upcoming discussions, I wanted to provide just a short overview presentation to introduce some of these concepts around emissions, carbon storage, and regenerative agriculture, which, which may be new to some of you. Um, next slide, please. So there are many different forms of coffee systems found around the world. Uh, these can be categorized by levels of diversification or shade or by specific species combinations. For example, on this figure on the left, it shows a typology of diverse systems ranging from complex jungle coffee polycultures on the top that are beginning to resemble natural forests in their diversity composition with, with high degrees of shade to more simple unshaded monoculture systems such as seen on the bottom, uh, typically with more in intensive management. Um, in a review of agroforestry systems in Vietnam, uh, ECRAF recently identified a wide range of Arabica and Robusta systems, including robust intercrop with fruit trees like avocado, durian, black pepper, macadamia, cashew, and, and a number of other species. Also, the Indonesia shade catalog produced by Conservation International and Partners documents about 130 different species of multi-purpose trees and plants that are often planted together with, with coffee across Indonesia. So the types of coffee systems and, and species combinations that are found are often specific for each coffee origin based on local climatic and ecological factors, as well as markets, culture, and, and farmer preferences. Uh, next slide, please. So we're talking about emissions from coffee um, and looking at agricultural systems in general. The main greenhouse gas emissions are carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. And to understand emissions in coffee systems, it's helpful to start with just a simple system such as a monoculture robusta coffee farm here. And emissions result from generally two main sources. Uh, on the one hand, all of the farm inputs that are applied throughout the growing season, particularly fertilizers and energy, the latter often used for dry season irrigation, for example. And with data on the type and quantity of inputs, we can combine this with specific emissions factors to then be able to estimate the amount of emissions associated with coffee production. And this is typically expressed as tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And the second main source of emissions here that needs to be accounted for is in relation to land use change, and particularly where coffee farms have been established following clearing of natural forest or other high carbon stock vegetation in the past. Um, there are also emissions further down in supply chain, uh, off farm, so to speak, such as energy used in processing waste and transportation to ports for export. In a future webinar that we'll be hosting will be devoted to this topic of greenhouse gas accounting in much more detail. But if we look at Vietnam, for example, uh, intensive robusta coffee farming um, in Vietnam is heavily dependent on high use of chemical fertilizers to maintain the high yield scene. In many cases, the farmers are actually over applying fertilizer, which results in reduced profitability as well as excess emissions. And so addressing this challenge can really therefore represent a win-win solution for both farmers and the climate. Excess fertilizer can also cause other problems like soil acidification and pollution of water bodies downstream. And our next speaker, uh, Centil Nathan of Inveritas, will be shedding more light on this important topic by sharing some of the results from a national fertilizer baseline study. Uh, next slide, please. When we talk about carbon sequestration, as we know, plants absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and store or sequester it in, the, in its biomass as it grows. Roughly 50% of plant biomass is, is carbon. And coffee systems also have different performance in terms of carbon sequestration based on their planting densities, the number of trees per hectare, the level of diversification, and other species that are grown alongside coffee, particularly from larger fruit and shade trees. And we can model how different systems and species combinations will accumulate biomass and carbon over time based on allometric equations of plant growth for specific species, as shown on these figures on the right that were developed by Agrologic as typically expressed as a carbon stock or tons of carbon per hectare over time. And the graph on the left here compares carbon stocks under a few different types of systems, looking at monoculture coffee uh, planted a thousand trees per hectare or coffee intercropped with different densities of durian and avocado. And where the monoculture farm will store about 40 tons of carbon per, 
uh, above ground carbon in, in 25 years. This can be increased by greater than 50% in other systems that are diversifying and intercropping um, shade and fruit trees. And then what happens to this biomass at the end of the, of the productive period of the coffee farm, about 25 years, is also quite important for the, the emission story. Uh, next slide, please. And so what do some of these systems look like in real life? Here's just a few visuals to give you of different Robusta systems from the Central Highlands in Vietnam, monoculture, Robusta with black pepper, and some diversified systems integrating uh, their fruit trees like avocado and durian. Uh, next slide, please. And so to, to better understand the dynamics of emissions and sequestration in different types of coffee systems, in early 2000, together with JDE Peets, IDH, and Agrologic, we looked at data from about 15,000 farmers um, collected by suppliers, ACOM, Louis-Dreyfus, Semexco, Mascopex, and the Global Coffee Platform. And this summary graph, we can see that annual emissions here in dark brown uh, decreased with increasing diversification from about four tons of carbon dioxide per hectare to about 2.5 tons in highly diversified systems. While the annual carbon sequestration shown in light brown and represented as negative emissions increased with increasing diversification as you would expect from about one ton to two tons. Uh, the net difference between emissions and sequestration, which is shown in gray on an annual basis is therefore much lower with diversified systems. Um, it should be noted, however, that this does not represent the full story, I would say, as emissions here only are from fertilizer and energy and did not account for emissions from land use change. Also sequestration only represented the above ground biomass and did not yet include other important carbon pools like roots and soil organic matter. So this dynamic is likely to change further with additional da data that can be incorporated. In this sample that we looked at of 15,000 farmers, about two thirds were in this monoculture category, which represents a very significant opportunity for improvement and diversification in the sector, which has over a half a million smallholder farmers in the Central Highlands landscape. Uh, next slide, please. And so a lot of what we want to talk about today is also focused on regenerative agriculture. Um, next slide, please. This has become probably one of the, the hottest buzzwords of today. We're hearing this uh, almost every conversation that um, is happening, um, but its meaning is quite elusive. It may depend a large, to a large degree on a specific context that you're talking about. It's even possible to find academic articles to trace the use of the term over time and try to distill its, its various meanings and, and how this term is used. But I think what it's trying to point to is farming practices that are restorative in nature. In some ways, it's trying to go beyond simple sustainability, in other words, sustaining yields over time to a situation that is improving over the long term rather than degrading. Other similar terms that are used might be things like ecological farming, or nature positive or nature-based solutions, for example. And this term implies really a renewed focus on soil health and the living soil food web as the foundation of productivity, stressing a need for a fundamental shift from feeding the plant to feeding the soil and the soil organisms. Uh, one useful framework to aid our thinking about regenerative agriculture focuses on these two aspects of practices and outcomes. The four key outcomes on the right here can be viewed as indicators for which we aim to see improvements over time. So increasing carbon stocks, improved water retention, cycling and enhanced water quality, greater biodiversity both above and below ground, and improved nutrient cycling and reduced dependence on chemical fertilizers, for example. With practices, we can list a whole range of different methods and management activities that can contribute to achieving these outcomes over time. A number relate to soil management, improved soil management, such as limiting and reducing soil disturbance and tillage, as well as integrating animals, plants, insects, soil organisms, and other complementary and beneficial species that can help naturally provide and enhance ecosystem services, such as nitrogen fixation, building of soil organic matter, et cetera. So these are some of the topics we'll be exploring further today during our webinar sessions. Uh, next slide, please. And just to quickly illustrate some of this from some examples from the field. Um, on the top, we see some, a pretty common scene of, of bare soil in the central highlands of Vietnam, prone to erosion and direct exposure to the sun with some limited mulching around some small seedlings in the foreground. On the bottom is a cover crop of perennial peanut, 
covering the ground. This plant helps to protect the soil as well as fixing nitrogen and providing a source of forage. And on the right is an example of a biochar application actually in a papaya plantation in Brazil. Now, many of you have probably heard about biochar before, which involves turning biomass into a form of bioactivated charcoal, which can greatly improve the water and nutrient holding capacity of soils, as well as lock up carbon in a relatively inert form lasting decades or longer. And this example of continuous application has resulted in deep, rich, and highly productive soils. Uh, next slide, please. And so in conclusion then, you know, how, how might we imagine what regenerative coffee systems could look like? How feasible is it for the average coffee farmer to transition from current production systems like intensive monoculture to more regenerative ones? What kinds of improvements can be expected in terms of carbon stocks and biodiversity, both above ground and below ground, as well as improving water, nutrient storage and cycling? And is this purely a win-win scenario or might there be some trade-offs involved that need to be carefully considered? For example, more diversified agroforestry systems may also result in greater competition for limited light, nutrients, and water among the different species grown. What is the right amount of shade for coffee? What species are complementary when grown together? Such diverse systems may be more resilient and even more profitable overall with a wider range of products, but few, fewer coffee trees may also mean lower coffee production. These are some of the topics we look forward to discussing in greater depth with our two expert panel discussions coming up. Uh, but let me next introduce Centil Nathan, who's the head of Asia operations for Inveritas, which is a US NGO that specializes in work in the coffee sector. And Centil will be sharing with us some results from a national, national fertilizer baseline study they have been conducting in Vietnam, together with the Western Highlands Agriculture and Forestry Science Institute, or WASI. Uh, okay, Centil, over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you, Barry. Um, I quickly scrolled through the list of participants, and I must say this is um, one of the excellent group of people I have addressed to. So um, thank you so much, all, for taking your time and. Um, joining in this webinar. I'm, I'm super excited to present some of the findings of the of the fertilizer study we did in Vietnam. Um, next slide, please. So um, before that, I'll quickly talk about Inveritas. Inveritas is a New York-based nonprofit. Um, we, we operate in more than 24 coffee producing countries across Asia, Africa, and North America. Uh, our mission is to eradicate poverty in the coffee sector. Uh, to that end, we work with coffee companies and their responsible sourcing strategies. We work with governments, other nonprofit organizations, sharing data, insights, uh, and studies. So this is one such project. You know, we we this is a, this is a four year project. Uh, we started six months back uh, in Vietnam. The ultimate goal of this project is to accomplish two things. One is to identify the optimal fertilizer limit which which farmer can apply to the soil given the current soil conditions and context and second is to identify the best practices in terms of fertilizer use and uh, transform that knowledge uh, to smallholder farmers across central highlands now i just want to call out the three companies who, who have been uh, working with us on this project jde nestle and smucker i, I see the executives from this company in this call Thank you so much for coming together to address this um, uh, critical sustainability challenge in Central Highlands. I, you made this possible. Thanks a lot. Uh, next slide. Uh, we started this um, study by comparing the percentage of farmers who apply synthetic fertilizers to coffee farms. Uh, you can see from this chart, Vietnam, virtually all the coffee farmers apply fertilizers, 99% of the farmers in Central Highlands apply some form of inorganic fertilizers to coffee trees, um, which is quite similar to a high intensive um, input and output model such as Brazil. But if you compare it with Indonesia, uh, in Asia or Uganda and Africa, it's much higher. So th that is a question which will come in our mind. Um, does higher input always lead to higher output? If a farmer can apply more fertilizer, uh, will it always lead to higher yields at the farm level? And this is a question uh, we wanted to understand, uh, and we started our analysis with. 
And what we found was fascinating. Next, please. Um, so you, you see the curve here, each dot represents a farmer. Um, the, the summary of the slide is, to some extent, yes. You know, if we plot all the thousands of coffee farmers we have interviewed and collected data from in Central Highlands, to some extent, we call it a stage one. Adding fertilizer gives positive return on investment to farmers, okay? Farmers add more fat fertilizers, they get better yields. But at certain stage, we call it a stage two, the yield plateaus. Basically, you know, the cost of input exceeds um, vis a -vis the yield farmers can get, you know, that's a stage two you're seeing. But that comes a stage where the returns are negative. You know, the farm, the more fertilizer you use, it doesn't proportionately give you extra output or in, increased coffee production, which is very unfortunate, right? Um, you know, the, but so, so we, we just wanted to deep dive into this phenomena um, and conduct a study and that's where it all started. But as I said, all these dot represent farmers and um, let, let's quickly understand um, the demographics of the farmers of Central Highland before, before I tell you what we did with this uh, curve and what, what are the next uh, steps we have taken with this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so farmers in Central Highlands are highly experienced. So they are experts in their game. Um, you know, on an average, they are 48 years old. Um, close to half of them are more than 50 years. Okay. And they have at least on an average, two thirds of the farmers have 15 years of experience growing coffee. Um, so, so they know the game really well. And for majority of the farmers, coffee is the major source of income. Okay, they rely on coffee for their livelihoods. Um, farmers are moderately educated. A quarter of the farmers have high school education and 3% of the farmers are graduates or went to colleges. Um, Comparing uh, to other countries in Southeast Asia, the gender dynamics is encouraging as well. Uh, one third of the coffee farmers are uh, female farmers in Central Highlands. Um, the, the reason I wanted to talk demographic is when we look at data, we often forget that there are people and livelihoods behind it. Um, so when, when we started this fertilizer project, you know, we want to be very sensitive because you know, to some extent fertilizer gives you better inputs. Um, so what we did was, next slide, please. We divided the, you remember the curve you saw? So we divided the farmers into three groups, you know, the, the high users, medium users, and low users. Um, let me quickly talk about these three categories. High users are the farmers who over apply fertilizers, but they don't get proportionate increase in yields. You know, the, the, and, you know, of course, as Barry talked about, um, it has a lot of externalities such as higher greenhouse gas emissions, higher input costs, um, lesser profitability, et cetera. Then there are medium users who are right at the optimal level, um, who use at the right level and get a reasonably good output. And there is a low user who, who underutilize fertilizers and which may affect tree health and the yields they get are lesser than the optimal. So if we can put the entire pool of Central Highland farmers into uh, a pie, 27% of the farmers are high users. You know, they use higher fertilizers, but they don't get proportionate increase in yields. Around 44% of the farmers are medium users. You know, they, they use a reasonably optimal quantity of fertilizer, they get reasonable yields. And 29% of the users are low users. Now, Central Highlands is a larger reason, right? There are thousands of farmers and thousands of hectares coffee is farmed. Um, as a next step, next slide please. What we wanted to do is, we, we tried to create a heat map across central highlands. You know, our goal was to identify, are there any specific clusters where these high uses are concentrated? Because our, our project is a four year project, there are phases. What you're seeing is just the results of the baseline. The subsequent steps are uh, further assessment, soil trials. So. It, it's really hard to do across Central Highland. So we drill the data further and uh, to identify clusters where high users are concentrated. And interestingly, there are five clusters popped out. Um, what you are seeing on the map, say Baolong, 51% of the farmers are high, high users of fertilizer. If you remember, for Central Highlands, it's just 27%. So farmers in Baolong are 2x 
of the farmers in Palom apply higher uh, rate of fertilizers than others at Central Highlands. Um, that applies to you know the other clusters you see, Lamha, Prongbu, Chuprong, Daksong, and Yagrai. Um, so in the interest of time, of course, it's, it's a 10 minutes presentation. So what I did was I just pulled out one cluster, uh, which is Balam, the top cluster, to give you all some insights about the farmer demographics and the fertilizer usage um, in that specific cluster. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the cluster level fertilizer insights. You know, you can see Bowlum. There's quite a lot to cover here, uh, but I, I just want to highlight two things. So I, I would love to draw your attention there. Look at the percentage of farmers who do soil or leaf test before they apply fertilizers, which is literally less than 5%. And that applies to all central highlands or Lamdung or Bowlum. You know, all three dots are clustered in the below 5% quadrant, if you see. That shows something. Um, we saw farmers are experienced and the way they currently apply fertilizers is largely a word of mouth learning or what they learn from their friends or ancestors from their communities, whatever. There is no scientific underpinning um, which aids farmers to apply the right level of fertilizers, which is a huge opportunity. And it's a no brainer as well, right? I mean, it reduces input costs. I see a lot of participants from Vietnam um, the fertilizer prices in Vietnam in the last 10 months has increased from 20% to 80% for various classes of fertilizers. And we are seeing this phenomenon across the world. Um, so farmers facing those input cost pressures, uh, applying fertilizers without getting proportional increase in yield is simply a no-brainer. And the second thing is um, the training. Many farmers get training, uh, at least one in two, and most of them get training uh, on fertilizer use and farming practices, okay? And I want to emphasize here, though that is not part of this, this slide, uh, almost two thirds of the farmers get their training from agrochemical companies, um, most likely to be fertilizer companies. Um, so it, it's a good opportunity to sit across the table and see whether these companies are promoting responsible use of fertilizers or their opportunities to explore further. Um, so th those are the two areas I just want to highlight. And one more thing quickly is, you know, the organic fertilizers. Uh, we often think this is a mutually exclusive one, right? People use chemical fertilizer, they exclude organic. But if you look at here, Bawalam fa farmers who are high users of fertilizers are also high users of organic fertilizers. Uh, so in a way, farmers are aware of the benefits of organic fertilizers or, or the soil health problems they have been facing. Next slide, please. Um, th this is a quick snapshot uh, on farm characteristics and farm management. Um, again, I just want to pull out one data point here. If you look at farm characteristics, um, just 31% of the farms in Baulam have shade trees. Uh, just to give you a comparative figure, it is around 90% in Duckluck province and around 70% in Central Highlands, um, which is a quick proxy to understand that farmers in these clusters are highly productivity focused. Um, so that, that's one area of opportunities. And, and many farmers do intercrop other food crops such as avocado and durian. There are some level of shade trees like acacia and senna present in those 31% of the farms. Uh, lastly, uh, farm management. Um, again, 36% of the farmers rejuvenate coffee trees, largely grafting, um, and around one in two farmers do mulching to cover crop and uh, to increase the soil organic matter. Um, I think I'm out of time. Um, I'll take one more minute. Next slide, please. Um, these are the next stages. You know, what I presented here is a very quick summary of the baseline we did. Um, and the subsequent phases of this project is we are planning to do on-farm assessments of fertilizer use uh, for the soil sample collection, fertilizer trials. And at the last stage, we want to define the optimal fertilizer use and we want to disseminate that information to smallholder farmers across Central Islands. Um, back to you, Barry. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Sintil, for the helpful, the, the brief overview and the enlightening presentation. And now I would like to invite our other three panelists to, to join this first panel discussion on reducing carbon emissions through nutrient and fertilizer management, improving soil health and regenerative practices. 
Uh, first, let me introduce Didier Lesur, who's a senior soil microbiologist, currently based in Hanoi with CRAD, as well as working with the Alliance of Biodiversity International in SEAT. And Didier has decades of experience in Africa and Southeast Asia, where he's been conducting research programs on plant soil microorganism interactions, including biological nitrogen fixation, beneficial microorganisms, and soil health. Uh, next, I'd like to also introduce Aline Dino with Ecom Trading Company based in Ho Chi Minh City, where she manages the company's sustainable management services agronomy division, providing a range of services to coffee farmers. And then I'd like to also introduce Hannes Zellweger based in Zurich, who is the managing director of Sophie's Group, an international sustainability project management and consulting firm. Hannes is an environmental engineer focusing on resource efficiency, circular economy, in particular on biochar production and utilization in coffee supply chains. So please panelists, um, turn on your videos and unmute yourselves. And I would also like to invite um, our uh, other participants. If you have questions for panelists, you are able to enter those into the Q&A. Um, I will begin with a few questions, but then we'll also try to pull some questions from, from the Q&A as well to, to direct those to our, to our speakers. And I'd like to maybe begin with a question for Aline at Ecom. As manager of your Ecom Sustainable Management Services Agronomy Division, you provide a range of services to farmers in Vietnam, coffee farmers in Vietnam, including in relation to fertilizer nutrient management as we've been discussing. Can you give us a bit more uh, idea around what kinds of services do you focus on? And how does what we just heard from Cintil track with your own experiences working directly with, with farmers on the ground? And specifically, what have been your learning in your efforts to help incentivize farmers to optimize and reduce the use of chemical fertilizers? Thank you very much, Barry. And hello, everyone. So at Ecom's agronomy division, SMS in Vietnam, we have been working to transition from a certification oriented unit to being a service provider for farmers. So the main reason is uh, that we have a will to provide farmers with solutions which match the recommendations that are given during the trainings or the farm visits. So we're really trying to transform recommendation into adoption. Um, when, when we look at the farm uh, and the impact analysis at the farm level, fertilization is clearly the first contributor to farm emissions. And we see that there's a lot of space for reduction even without impacting yield. So this was shown also in the presentation earlier. Uh, the trend is still today clearly uh, in over application or misapplication in the nutrient balance or even the schedule. Um, so from there, there's several layers of approach that we can have for intervention linked to soil and nutrition. And it really depends on the farmer's individual baseline situation. So I think working towards reg regenerative agriculture would have a different path, whether we're working in Vietnam or in Uganda, for example. Um, in Vietnam, we're first looking at optimizing the fertilizer applications and all the investments that go with it. So making sure that what is applied is not wasted, um, looking at the quality of what is applied and, and the balance and the schedule in the nutrient application. So concretely, what we have developed um, within SMS is, first of all, a soil testing service We're using AgroCare's portable soil scanner. Uh, so we're able to go to the farm and provide an on-site uh, tailored recommendation, which are really adapted to the needs at the farm level. And this really connects with what Santo presented earlier as well, because it's really uncommon uh, to have soil testing and it, it can have a, a great impact. Um, and to complete the service, we also stand as a fertilizer provider or more generally a solutions provider with adapted packages based on the farmer's need, maybe on the soil testing result or the financial capacities of the farmer. And we're just also looking constantly at new solutions, uh, working with partners such as the ones that we have in the panel today, so Sirad or Sophie's, and looking at um, demo plots, seeing how we can adapt practices to the local context, um, designing something that will support 
the carbon reduction and be cost efficient because at the end of the day, it's the major criteria for adoption. So ideally, we're really looking towards uh, addressing fertilization from a systemic point of view. We're not just looking at an NPK formula. Uh, it should be addressed uh, through various lenses. So looking at all nutrients, uh, including the micronutrients, but also looking at the pH the structure of the soil the life of the activity, so everything that reflects the tree's capacity to uptake nutrients and even other factors, so maybe the sensitivity to nematodes. Uh, so it really shows that it's a system. And I think today addressing it as a system is a challenge, especially if we're looking uh, to address it at a large scale because every farmer has their own context. And Finally, to answer the last part of your question, um, our experience in implementing um, those interventions has taught us that we will have better success in recommending something that is not too far from farmers' current habits. So looking at a progressive transition towards the final optimal. And it also goes with the adoption of new practice, practices, for example, on the part of the farm first to limit the risk perception from the farmer's standpoint. And also because seeing is believing, so uh, this will help to support a more general adoption at, at the farm level and maybe at the cluster level if we look at, at, at the tips from a larger scale. Great. Thanks, Aline. It's really important points around the understanding the system as a whole and, and how the different parts and challenges are all interrelated. Um, I'd like to maybe turn a little bit now to Didier um, and ask him a question. As, as a soil microbiologist, you're really focused on soil health and the soil food web. And even though we know that's kind of out of sight below the surface, it's hard to kind of visualize and imagine that. But from your work around the world and, and with coffee systems in particular, what do you see as the most sort of promising regenerative practices that can improve soil health and productivity while reducing dependencies on, on chemical fertilizer inputs? Yeah, thanks, Barry. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, yes, that's a very interesting question, by the way but not an easy one. Um, yeah, as you know, that um, after decades of very intensive management of coffee plantation with chemical inputs, now we are facing a very uh, critical situation in Central Island, for instance, and I was very interested by the previous presentation because it shows clearly where are the problems, and but now we have to work on, and we have to work out to find the uh, solutions. So uh, we are right now we are running two projects trying to improve soil health. And uh, for this project, uh, we are trying to learn from farmers and we try to see what is possible to do with them. So when you visit farms, you can see that people talk about some what we call traditional methodologies they can apply. So one is kind of biochar-like and when you ask them, they ask, they tell you that they have problem with uh, low soil pH. And this is the entry point. So for one of the projects we have been running, we are trying to see how we can um, improve the situation with uh, regarding soil bone pests and diseases by increasing the soil pH. So we have several options. Uh, Anes will talk about biochar for sure. But uh, for the time being, because we are still looking for secure sources of biochar in Vietnam, for instance, we try to use lime because lime is available everywhere. And uh, we apply lime and we make a kind of follow up. And the idea is um, by increasing the soil pH, we expect uh, soil biodiversity to get increased, to be improved, and to leave less room to soil born, post, uh, born and pests and diseases such as nematode for coffee. And once you have more soil biodiversity, you get more nutrients available for the plants. So it's a kind of cycle. So if you make more uh, nutrients available for the plants, you will definitely improve the system and your dependency of mineral fertilizer will be less. So that's the idea. I, I'm not going to list all the strategy we can do to do that, but uh, at least by raising pH, by doing intercropping with uh, legumes, we are, which are capable to fix atmospheric nitrogen through BNF. And some of these legumes species can also 
um, contribute to mitigate the population of nematodes because they have some uh, nematicide effects such as crotalaria. That's a kind of combination of solution we have been testing uh, and we, we do that in farms and we expect that uh, we will be able to come up with some ideas. But something very much important and it's already been raised already, but I think it's important. It's right now we need to find solution because the situation for coffee is quite critical in Central Island. So we cannot keep keep going on, keep going on with mineral fertilizer intensive management because now we have to replant many plantation of coffee and uh, to do so it's not easy because we have got a lot of problems. So that's why we, we have to work closely with a local association and so on and see how it works. Yeah, that's my message. Thanks Didier, I think that's an important point about the first step and perhaps that's where the you know, raising the pH and, and some um, additions of lime can really help uh, boost things in the right direction and then other practices can be integrated. You also referenced biochar and I think that's a good segue to a question for Hannes to talk a little bit more about, um, we're hearing a lot more about biochar these days. I think it's you know, often pointed to as a, as a significant potential you know, climate solution can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly is biochar and what do you see as the promising potentials for biochar utilization within coffee supply chains? Yes, uh, hello everyone. Um, let me start maybe from the other side. Uh, we have been talking a lot on, on the production side, but there's also the, let's say, the, the, the big uh, stakeholders, they all commit to net zero. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the Nestle, the Starbucks, the Nespresso, whatever uh, they say, we want to be net zero in 2050. So there, there needs a roadmap to go there. And um, one third, I would say one third of the LCA, of the, uh, of the emissions in the coffee production is actually coming from uh, the farm uh, sector. So there will be in the future pressure to uh, minimize uh, the carbon footprint on the farm. Um, I'm very happy to hear that now here as well, there's, we need a portfolio of measures. We need a portfolio of measures. We are talking about fertilizer, intercrop, uh, all good. Uh, we, we hear about the uh, uh, agroforestry, a, a, a huge potential. What is key, we need negative emission technologies. Otherwise, we'll never become, not from the perspective of, of, of the big ones, or um, we need negative uh, emission technology. So we have agroforestry. But we need a portfolio. So I think, uh, and, and their biochar is very interesting. It's adding another uh, technology or solution uh, to how to become uh, uh, net zero. And in addition, I would say uh, there is a, a, a strong focus, as Didier was saying, on the potential to even have other benefits uh, on soil, um, uh, etc. So uh, we as Sophia's, we are a promoter and facilitator for biochar production and application. Uh, we have a very strong focus on um, how to bring the technology to this country. So we have examples now in Vietnam, uh, we're going now to Peru, to Nicaragua. Uh, it's nice to have uh, the idea to apply uh, biochar, but if you, if you can't produce it, um, import it from Europe or USA, I think that doesn't really make sense. So our goal is really to bring to this, this technology there to have a local producer to um, being able to uh, to produce it, to know the market, to maintain it, and um, uh, to link with uh, institutions like uh, Sierra uh, to to see how this can be uh, applied to the soil. Um, what is biochar? I think I will not go to uh, too much into detail. You named a few. Um, you know, benefits, water storage capacity, bring carbon back to the soil, etc. Um, I mean, it's it's like the, the the charcoal for barbecue, but uh, more in a let's say in a standardized way to uh, to produce it um, uh, with very specific uh, characteristics. Um, what we are doing now in the coffee sector, I think, and I always always like to also speak about the potential and leverage you have. I mean, the coffee farmer has a lot of biomass. Uh, we have coffee husk, we have uh, wood. Uh, if you go more into agroforestry, we have cu wood cutting. So um, they, they are at the source of biomass and um, we try to, to valorize, valorize that as 
best as we can. So uh, different option of composting, uh, of mulking, but as well um, in, 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 in the production of, uh, uh, to produce this biochar. This is one, so we have the leverage, we have a potential uh, to, to uh, get active. The second one uh, maybe is that we are always trying to use synergy. So uh, also the question on, 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 on the business case. So we are producing biochar, but with the machines we are promoting, it's not only biochar, but we have also the heat. So going to uh, the, the, the drying process to use heat to, uh, to have different pillars of benefit. So, and I think the heat is a very easy way to, to enter, whereas the uh, application uh, in, in the soil needs uh, trust, needs uh, a paradigm change, needs uh, a, a lot more. And very happy that uh, actors now in Vietnam are really picking that up and try to showcase um, you know, uh, re regenerative agriculture practices and, and so on. Um, so we, we used in synergies to produce uh, heat to dry. Uh, we have the biochar, which can be either applied within their own uh, value chain. So in, 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 in coffee, but we have seen that there's a big potential as well in, in, in intercropping for pepper, uh, durians on, on very high value crops. Uh, which have the same, I would say, the, the same challenges. So if we go into different crops that mushroom or, or, or so on, that there's a, a big value as well. And the, last but not least, I would say it's, I mean, the price for the removal credits are just increasing. Uh, if you see the market in Europe on, on biochar, uh, they pay uh, $1,000 in Switzerland for one ton of biochar. They pay about 60 to 100 dollars for uh, uh, the removal. Um, so there's a, I would say, starting now to the future, uh, there's a huge market and a huge potential also in this carbon credit market uh, uh, for, for biochar as well. So um, I would rather put it the other way. I think with biochar, we really have a, a huge potential to support the value chain in in these different uh, pathways. One is uh, net zero, implementing net zero, uh, but also on this regenerative agriculture practices. This is maybe as a summary uh, of what we uh, do in, in biochar. Thanks, Hannes, for that comprehensive uh, response. And I think your points around the portfolio of responses that are needed, you know, links very closely to, to Aline's comment about the systemic perspective that's needed for the sector um, and, and the, the, the variety of solutions that are available. Um, and, I, and I know there's a lot of very um, interesting and thoughtful questions in the Q&A, which um, I don't think we're gonna have time to get too many of because we're running a bit short on time. And uh, the next panel discussion will be talking more about intercropping and diversification. So we'll save some of that discussion for there. But what I thought I would maybe end on uh, for this session was maybe just a linking back to some comments that, that Rupa made earlier at the outset around um, the need for a sort of transformative change. And you know, here on this call and, and in other webinars and discussions, we have you know, uh, a, a large network of uh, private sector companies, traders, um, nonprofits you know, working in with farmers, um, farmers cooperatives, et cetera. And I maybe wanted to maybe pose a question to that and give each of you a chance to provide maybe a thought that you have in relation to this concept of transformative change. What, what would be maybe one suggestion that you could offer to the group of how um, collaboration amongst the different stakeholders could help facilitate such a transformational change in the coffee sector? We're obviously talking a lot about Vietnam, so we can use that as an example, let's say, but maybe could you, could you offer maybe one idea or one thought, one suggestion as a, as a closing for this uh, session around um, uh, how this kind of transformative change could, could be facilitated or, 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 um, or further accelerated. Maybe um, can we start with uh, Didier, is that, is that okay? Yeah. And I'd also like to ask uh, uh, Sentil to offer your thought as well on this, on this question and then we'll um, have to um, pass it on to the next panelist group. 
Yeah, I think as I said previously, uh, we have to work closely with farmers because the idea is not to come up with technologies that they will be, won't be able to afford. So we try to see what is uh, available, to see how the cost as well, because I mean that if they have to spend money on something, they need to get something back. And uh, so we always try to work closely with them. And uh, But at, as I said, that when the situation becomes very, very um, critical, it means that we have to introduce the way how they have to change. And that's the, the, the tricky part. But working with, um, with our national partners and also NGOs and private companies, I think it should be, we, we expect to be successful. We have to be successful, yes. I kind of like that idea, the financial aspect, you know, the, the full value supply chain, who is taking, uh, you know, the, the, the risk and who will pay, for example, for net zero. So now it's a, it's a vision, for example, yeah, we have to be net zero in 2050, but who is paying for it? And uh, so uh, to engage along the supply chain to uh, overcome this, uh, yeah, the, the net zero and also the regenerative agriculture. I think this is, uh, if this can yeah, be discussed along the supply chain and, you know, support each other, I think this would be very interesting for the transformation. Great. We'll have a future webinar topic on climate finance. Hopefully we can do yeah, that. And then I have to listen. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, maybe, Cintil, I think you're unmuted. Would you like to go next? And then we'll finish up with Aline with any final thoughts. Sure, absolutely. My experience working with smallholder farmers in more than 15 countries is they believe more from what they see than what they hear. Um, so when it comes to issues like fertilizer use, which touches the livelihoods of smallholders because it directly impacts yields, directly impacts income, and you know smallholders' income is not a big basket of money, it's a small basket. It has very little elasticity. We have to be careful. So my suggestion is, Start with a small proof of concept, test it out, see if that works, and then show that to the smallholder farmers. That's precisely what we are trying to do with Nestle, JD, and Smuckers, and Wasi in Vietnam. We, we zero down on high-use farmers, we zero down on specific clusters, and we are going to conduct some trails for the next few years, see how that works. We may be right or wrong in our hypothesis, but whatever we learn from this, we are going to take those learnings and share it with governments, partners, and smallholder farmers across the Central Highlands. So that would be my summary thoughts, Barry. Great, thank you, uh, Aline. Any any final thoughts for the for the group? Yeah, maybe I can um, continue on Central's idea. I mean, I think uh, farmers sometimes are reluctant to adopting new practices, for example, soil testing, because they just see it as an additional cost and they don't see the potential savings or the potential benefits which this could bring. So the idea is to support or subsidize maybe to reach the early adopters to show the first benefits. And then once those are visible, it can more naturally expand and be adopted by a larger network of farmers. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, There's this is a really rich discussion and we can probably go on for probably hours longer if we had more time, but there's a lot of great questions as well in the Q&A box. And I would, um, in addition to thanking the panelists for your time and, and insights today to, if there's any questions in there that you would like to answer in the, the Q&A chat, feel free to do so afterwards. Um, and you know, thank you again for your, for your time and um, looking forward now to moving on to our next um, discussion. So I will pass it back to Christy. Thank you, Barry. Um, also thank you, Santil, Didier, and Aline and Hannes. Um, our next section is a panel discussion, as Barry mentioned, on, on intercropping strategies to uh, diversify farm, copy farms, profitability, and enhance carbon storage. Uh, to moderate this session, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Ms. Tran Qui, uh, Quinn Chi. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, Ms. Chi is currently the Regional Act, uh, Director for Asia Landscapes with IDH, uh, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, and she oversees seven landscapes in four countries of India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. Uh, so Chi, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours and, and let's get it, get us it started on your panel. Thank you very much, Christy. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So it's, uh, it's my pr great pleasure to be here to, to uh, 
support uh, to the moderation of this uh, very interesting dialogue on sustainable coffee via the intercropping and agroforestry system. As, uh, as you can already, already see from the two first uh, presentations, that this is the, the very important solution for carbon sequestration, but also a solution for living income for the farmer by a diversification of the income sources as well. And how amazing you can see an example from Vietnam uh, via the, the IDH programs with companies that uh, carbon footprint of the highly diversified farms is significantly up to 70% lower than monocropping system. So this is really creates the momentum for us to co-action towards uh, the low emission and sustainable coffee system. And with that, I'd like to introduce you the three speakers uh, from the uh, panel two. So firstly, uh, Clement Rigo, uh, tropical ag agronomist of uh, CIRAT and World Forestry, Agroforestry in Vietnam. And his uh, research specializes in coffee agronomy and the transition towards more sustainable farming practices by using a mix of field measurements and modeling in Southeast Asia region. And the second one I'd like to introduce to you is Mr. Dave Dehas, a country representative of Sustainable Coffee Vietnam from Tibo. Uh, before working for Tibo, Dave spent more than 20% doing uh, researches and promote public-private partnership programs to promote sustainable coffee production in Vietnam and Asia Pacific region. And now, last but not least, uh, is the representative from private sector, Mr. Pete, Van Aston, uh, Head of Sustainable Production Systems, uh, Coffee, Olam, Food Ingredients. Uh, this is uh, passionate about sustainability to develop, adapt, and apply technologies and upload approaches and services that improve productivity, profitability, and carbon footprint of uh, Olam coffee plantations uh, at the landscape level. And he based it in Singapore. So now I'd like to invite three of you as a speakers to turn on your uh, video and unmute yourself uh, for us to start with our interesting discussion. So uh, the first question is coming to all three of you with uh, three different perspectives uh, from your knowledge and experience is that what is the best or the most appropriate coffee production ecosystems uh, to you uh, in terms of sustainability, profitability, and especially climate benefits. And the climate benefits here also means uh, including carbon emission uh, sequestration um, for, the, for the system. So with that uh, question, firstly, I'd like to invite Clema, um, who is a uh, representative for the agronomist perspective. Uh, could you please uh, share with us some of your uh, opinion and knowledge uh, and, and experiences about this? Thank you. Well, thank you, Quincy, and uh, hello, everybody. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. It's my pleasure to share a few insights on uh, this question. Uh, I will not be able to give you a best answer type of scenario, but I can share a few, a few insights. And um, regarding diversification, Vietnam is a very interesting case because it, it has moved from uh, monoculture coffee to some intercropping with pepper in the, in the year 2000. And now there is more and more intercropping with fruit trees, avocado, macadamia, durian. So in Vietnam, we can see a lot of monoculture systems coffee, pepper, fruit tree, monoculture systems, but also a lot of very diverse systems mixing in different ways, in different combinations, all of these crops together. And uh, what, what we can see from the agronomic uh, point of view is that uh, it's beneficial to mix these because you have higher yields on the same area. Uh, on, the, on one hectare, for instance, you can have higher yield of coffee, avocado, and pepper if you mix them. You have a bit less coffee than you, if you only do coffee, you'll have a bit less avocado than if you only do avocado. Uh, but if you mix these together, the, um, this compensates uh, actually and becomes beneficial. So with the same area, you can have like higher yields. You can also like better use your inputs, uh, fertilizer, irrigation with the same level of inputs when you diversify. And this has been seen in Vietnam. It's also been seen in many other places you are more efficient in using these inputs. So you, you do get these agronomic benefits like higher yields 
uh, with the same level of inputs and the same unit of land. Regarding the environmental benefits, I'm, I would be more cautious uh, because Jedam is extremely intensive and most of the environmental drawbacks of the degradations come actually from the farming practices and the level of inputs. We talked a lot about fertilizers, for instance. Uh, that's also um, a, a key component when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions. So there would be a little bit of carbon sequestration if we plant trees, like fruit trees, but these trees also uh, are fertilized. So they will also contribute in their way to carbon emissions and they will never grow extremely big. They're not timber trees. So there will be some benefits, but if we really want to, to go towards climate change mitigation, the key thing is to change the farming practices uh, and diversification would not be enough towards that path. It, it would be different in other countries, like in Indonesia, for instance, where it's less intensive, there would be more environmental benefits from this diversification from agroforestry systems. In Vietnam, I really believe that diversification would be uh, very beneficial from an agronomic point of view, uh, not necessarily enough from an environmental point of view. So like in short, the best system is a diverse coffee system, but also a system with lower inputs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clemon. It is a very interesting observations uh, from the different systems from Indonesia and, and Vietnam, especially on the environmental benefits of this uh, diversification system. So from what you just mentioned, I understand that uh, possibly the agroforestry system where we put more forestry trees into the coffee farms along with the other diversified crops might be also a solution for Vietnam in order to uh, have more carbon sequestration on the coffee farm. Right. So coming from there, I think that uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Dave, uh, who has a very practical and um, uh, practical view and also the research, the research perspective from his many researches that you have done in Vietnam uh, on, on this topic as well. How do you think of, of, of which should be like the most benefits coming out of the diversific diversification system? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. G, and thanks to the organizers for having me today. I'm very happy to see the list of participants today, many, uh, many known people, many old friends. Um, I actually would like to, to build on what Clement just mentioned, because he was saying, OK, we, um, we're going to put different crops together. We may have a reduction of coffee uh, yields and so on. Um, I had the opportunity uh, last year uh, to work for the International Union for Nature Conservation. And we did kind of a macroeconomic study. And we took the model that WASI is currently promoting, where you would intercrop uh, coffee with uh, avocados, uh, durians, and pepper. And then wanted to see what are the uh, environmental and climate related benefits. But more importantly, I think that's where it should all start. What will be the economic benefits for the, for the farmers? Um, the study was focusing on Dak Lake province only for the time being, uh, because it's the major coffee pro uh, province uh, in, 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 in Vietnam for Robusta. So firstly, uh, in terms of envi environmental and climate change benefits, I would say carbon sequestration is definitely one. Um, we see that if you would grow um, uh, coffee intercropped over a 30 year time span, we could actually generate about 12 tons of carbon per hectare. If we would stay in monocrop, that would be only half. So we can double the sequestration. However, I want to make an important side note here, and I hope we still have time to come back to, uh, to, to Hannes uh, talking about biochar, because my concern is that yeah, we have a cycle of 20 or 30 years, and then we're going to have to rejuvenate the farms. So what are we going to do with the wood? I think that's an important question we have to reflect about. Second important thing is that if you start diversifying, I mean, here in Vietnam, coffee is heavily irrigated. Um, if we start diversifying and we start to optimize the irrigation volumes, we can save 40% of water. And that's not only going to be beneficial for the uh, farmers in the uplands, um, but this will also have positive effects to the lowlands, even the, 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 the lower Mekong areas and cross, cross boundary. Um, farmers in Laos and in Cambodia will benefit. Um, and if you reduce water, it will come with energy saving 
and labor saving. And again, the energy element is climate related. We can save about 30% in terms of energy. And at the landscape uh, level, this would be equivalent to a value of about 14 million US dollars per year. Now, the more important part, to my opinion, is what are the economic benefits for the farmers? Um, and, and, and Clement was mentioning, like, maybe we will have a reduction in coffee production. And I'm quite sure that globally, uh, the industry will be worried because Vietnam is a major player globally. Um, from the study, we learned that if we take out 20% of the trees on a hectare, we can actually still increase the productivity of coffee only by 30%. And this is because we would actually start to use uh, the higher yielding varieties, the, the, the disease free or resistant varieties, which can yield theoretically six tons of green bean per, uh, per hectare, six tons of green bean uh, per hectare. Um, now, one concern here is that, of course, uh, you won't have that effect immediately. It takes about 11 years to break even. So the farmers compared to current practice, they would incur some, some, some costs, I mean, some losses. However, from the 14th year onwards, the likelihood to make a loss uh, or the likelihood to make profit is over 80% from the 14th year. And you would start to increase actually your profitability by about 20%. And if you look really at the long run, 25 years, uh, you would be able to have a gross revenue for the intercrop system, which is 43% higher than staying in monocrop. So I think it makes sense to, uh, to, 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 to move into diversification. I still want to make one more side note here. Um, of course, in this modeling, if you start introducing intercrops, we're going to flood the market with avocados, durians, and pepper. So what I think we need to do is to look for further alternatives so that we can further diversify and make sure that it makes market sense for the, for the farmers. I will stop here for the time being, Mrs. G. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, I think that your points are quite interesting and also a very interesting opening for, for many thought, food for thought, right? As, as the next steps of how do we think about the uh, replantation process, uh, how, how many years that we have to understand that it will, we might not uh, have like the, the best ill for the economics of the farmers and also how to deal with the intercropping system if the supply is, uh, is, is so much more than, than the demand. And, and if there's no marketing mechanism there that, that should uh, help the farmers better. So, so with that, I'd like to shift uh, this question to Pete Van Essen uh, from Olam to share your point of view so from the uh, companies and, uh, and from the path farmers perspective. How, how do you see this? Thanks, Chi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Thanks. And uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to echo what Dave was already saying, right? Many thanks, you know, to you and the organizers of this event, you know, and, and it's really nice indeed to see, you know, many, many colleagues and friends, even from Africa, you know, attending over here. So really good. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the, the sequence has been ideal for me because uh, I think with Clement and Dave, you know, they've really covered a lot of the, the agronomics, you know, even now, of course, Dave talking about the farm economics. Now, of course, we look at the business economics. For us, of course, as a company, uh, like any supply chain company in, in, in coffee, right? We are looking for four for four elements when we work with act, when we work with farmers right and we work with supply chain actors quantity of the coffee the quality of the coffee the consistency of that supply right because you have a peak year and then you have a drop year it's really difficult actually you know to uh, to work with the farmers as well and and you know to work with supply chain actors so we need to have that consistency and of course you know uh, increasingly important is is the footprint and and we've talked a lot you know of course now about the carbon footprint Dave already alluded, you know, to the to the water footprint, which is also very important. And I think, you know, uh, we haven't, of course, necessarily talked about biodiversity, but I think it's relevant to mention, you know, of course, that when you diversify your cropping system, you also diversify, right, the your ecosystem. You'll have more uh, uh, pollinators. You'll have more predators. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the actors in Vietnam will know, right, that they are. 
at least they were at least you know world record holders i think you know in terms of glyphosate contamination in the coffee and and of course the government really you know moved in dramatically and say that is gone right we don't want to have it but but then how do you deal with that right so so of course you have to compete coffee you know is, is weeds are competing with coffee and you'd have to weed but instead of weeding right you can better have crops there that actually generate some some value right and so i think uh, from an agronomic point of view i also believe you know that when you have uh, food crops or or tree crops you know like avocado or durian uh, pepper or food crops you know or cover crops into your system it's also a way right to reduce your your uh, your weed pressure or to be motivated right to actually invest in that mechanical weeding which now will be needed right and and also you know in terms of the pesticides a lot of good studies that show you know with diversities of trees and diversities therefore you know of of flowering uh, you'll have more natural predators you can reduce for example on your your use of chlorpyrifos right which has now been also banned you know in in europe in the us market in japan market and so all of this requires changes right and i think intercropping is really at least one of the avenues you know to to create these more and encourage these more sustainable practices of course, on the downside, you know, as Clement already said, yeah, it might negatively impact your your productivity. But I think, you know, for for um, for the business, it's really important, you know, that coffee farmers remain motivated. You know, we've just come down, of course, from a massive down cycle in coffee prices. Uh, you know, uh, with with of course, it's sad for for some of the Brazilian coffee farmers that were hit by drought, you know, and and frost. But the rest of the coffee world, of course, you know, is very happy with the increased prices. And finally, you know, there is a good profit margin. But we see in many cases, right, that and as Dave just said, right, if everybody starts to flood the market with durian or avocados, particularly the fresh fruits, you know, is difficult to evacuate. I think pepper, of course, you know, is different because you can feed into a world market. Your price is more stable. But to think, you know, around these markets of, of which intercrops to promote, you know, and how to do that, I think is really important. But for us. Uh, from a company perspective, if we can motivate the farmer, you know, to remain interested in maintaining their coffee field, because, you know, the durian, the pepper, uh, you know, uh, the avocado, banana, whatever it is, right, is basically maintained or is encouraging them, you know, to maintain that field, even when there is a low price, at least these other crops, you know, give you the money, then you maintain. That has a lot of value for us, right, rather than go in this pick cycle where people, you know, are excited about high prices, then start planting coffee. Then, you know, three, four years later, everybody starts to harvest, price drops, you know, and, and they start uprooting the coffee. I think, you know, nobody in the industry uh, really sees that as a benefit. And from that perspective, we see that there might be a bit of yield penalty uh, with the intercropping practice. But I think the benefits, you know, in terms of the footprinting, uh, we haven't talked about the living wage debate, right? But there is a lot of discussions now around living wage as well. Uh, even there, right, the intercropping helps. So I think, you know, yeah. Uh, I, I see that there might be some negatives on the quantity. The, the quality it depends, of course, what crop and how you practice. The consistency of supply definitely, you know, would probably be benefiting, particularly when you work with, with shade trees, right? It will reduce the yield, but it will level it off a bit more. So, and the footprinting in general, you know, we see we see benefits, but I, I, I agree with Dave as well, right? And, and, and with uh, Clement, watch out there, right? There is no silver bullet. It's not because, oh, you start planting this, that your footprint will go down in terms of water, in terms of carbon, in terms of living wage, you know. No, you know, you have to be very careful, very site specific, and of course, co-design these practices, you know, with your local actors. So at least as a as a business, right, this is what we what we try to do as well. We know that uh, we are not the ones, you know, who can who can switch on or switch off, right? Uh, coffee supply or what the farmers should do. They are ultimately right, the ones who are running the practices. So the only thing that we can do is try to see how with with other actors in that landscape right we can we can uh, yeah we can give sustainable solutions i'll, I'll stop there thank you very much pete uh, for your very uh, rich uh, uh, sharing from the perspective of the company how you expect the farmer to maintain the coffee system while they are having diversified other income sources and also create a better, uh, the improved footprint from their farm as well. So I see that from um, our question and answer, we have a number of questions uh, that is uh, quite interesting. And I see that the first question coming there is, is on the, we know that this kind of system has uh, pros and cons, it has the challenges on this, it has the, the, the advantages on that expect. 
Uh, however, when talking about the scaling, there will be a number of, uh, of other challenges and issues that we really need to support. So from your um, experiences and knowledge, how do you see that what should be like the recommendations for the scaling of the adoption of such practices? So we don't talk about piloting anymore. We talk about how to scale those practices up and to improve the adoption from the farmers for the uh, in taking into consideration of uh, pros and cons that you uh, both uh, all three just mentioned. So I'd like to go first with Dave. Uh, could you please uh, give us the, your opinion on this? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chi. Um, well, I think uh, what is very important is, I mean, we have, over the last 20 years, we have been training the farmers, technically. What I am missing is uh, entrepreneurial skill training, uh, financial literacy training. I have seen projects where they work very much on that and where the farmer really understands what are the costs and what are the benefits. And this could help. Um, but um, of course, this requires uh, investments. And when I look at the DACLA case in, in particular, it would not be very, very expensive. $60 per year per farmer could do it over a time horizon of, of, of 30 years. But still, if we know that the farmer is going to incur losses compared to the current situation, we have to look further, I think. And what I was thinking of, look, if you have a training program, we need to invest in seedlings. I mean, high yielding or, or high quality seedlings for coffee, for the intercrops. We need professional nurseries. Um, maybe part of this can be covered by the government. I mean, they have an extension system and maybe we can embed such a program partially into that, which would then look like maybe a subsidy uh, by government. Uh, I'm not in favor of subsidizing the seedlings 100%. Second thing, of course, the banks. Um, at the moment, I think the situation in Vietnam is very difficult for farmers because if you take a loan, you have to give your land title. And that I think is not going to work because farmers need, loan, need loans on an annual basis already for their, to buy their inputs. So I think we need to have a very open conversation with banks. And then maybe a more controversial idea, and that is maybe adding to what Aline was telling, which I find very interesting. And she said, we're going from certification to service orientation, service oriented approach. So what shall we do with the certification premiums? Do we keep on paying them to the farmer or shall we put them in an agricultural transformation fund and use that to, I mean, to go further and, and, and to, I mean, to realize what we're, what we're discussing. The last idea I have is yeah, maybe the, the farmer pay for service and inputs model. So I think we, I don't think one of each that I suggest is, is unique or the only solution. I think we need to have a combination of, of all of them. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Dave, and I think that uh, that that uh, your answer on the service-oriented solution or the input service uh, provision for the farmers might be also combined with the business um, uh, business incentives for investment. Which, with that, I'd like to go to Pete. Could you please elaborate more about that uh, business incentives for the farmers? Yeah, I, I think, of course, the business, you know, uh, for, for business, you know, at least to invest in this, right, it really depends, you know, on the supply chain and the supply chain model, of course, and, and uh, Vietnam, of course, is quite, you know, uh, not unique, but I mean, a number, of course, of robust origins often, you know, work with, uh, with the level of aggregators and, and not a direct, you know, uh, link between, let's say, the exporter of the coffee, you know, and, uh, and the grower of the coffee. So I think it's always good, right, what do we, we, we talk here, of course, for for Asia, you know, the USA the Green Invest Asia, but we very much focus on Vietnam. So I, I take that into account, right? I think one of the tools, and I think Aline and, and maybe Dave also already alluded to that a little bit, you know, is, uh, is also the digital services, right? So I think when particularly when you... Um, when you have this supply chain where you have a number number of aggregators right and the distance sometimes between what the farmer does you know and and when it leaves and when it's being roasted becomes larger uh then of course there is more need you know for either public uh, institutions you know and public investments to help everybody or you know uh, for farmers of course to be equipped themselves you know with 
with uh, digital tools that can be information. Uh, it can also be increasingly right uh, uh, systems where you can record uh, your inputs, your outputs, use, etc. Uh, that can also be in cooperatives, you know, or in groups or through whatever means. Uh, this, of course, you know, once you have that data, it becomes also um, in relevant, right, for credit scoring. Uh, if you have three, four years, you know, of farm data that, oh, they've always been supplying this much of coffee, then, of course, it becomes much more interesting for a lot of uh, credit providers, you know, to say, well, we can work with this farmer because, you know, the credit scoring is there. So I think the digital tools should be really becoming two ways. One, of course, you know, even, even if companies like ourselves and roasters want to have that carbon footprint or that living wage or that other right or low pesticides or uh, uh, claim, you need to have traceability. That requires, of course, digital tools. So that's, let's say, one information goes from the farmer up into that supply chain. And then, of course, then to bring that back, right, what kind of services, uh, whether it is by SMS, or whether it is you know through smartphones or other means right but what kind of digital information flow can we bring down to these farmers and to what extent right can you as dave alluded right tag that in with 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 the supply of credit i think the last comment i wanted to make there is to uh, and and also the project right with with idh and, and a number of partners all i'm also of course participated there you know in that luck uh, you know it, it showed as well right that there is quite a diversity of farmers we see globally of course that Generally, 20 to 30 percent of the top, the top 20, 30 percent of the farmers, you know, supply 70 to 80 percent of the volume. In in Vietnam, it's a little bit more even, so it's about the top third, you know, provides two thirds of the volume. But we also see that, you know, that 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 uh, the smaller farms are more diversified. They have, you know, different livelihoods needs. They have different resource uh, uh, availability. Uh, they have different ambitions, right? When it comes to coffee, they don't necessarily see coffee as their prime source, you know, of income and business development. And so, you know, the needs of these farmers, in terms of what intercrop, you know, in terms of what kind of support services, is different from, let's say, that larger farm that has six or ten hectares, you know, is highly specialized and just wants even, you know, to get knowledge from you and from me and from others and from Dave and Clement. How can I even become more efficient, right? Reduce my footprint, more water, right? So that is a different kind of of knowledge need. So. I think it is important that as we think further about this service delivery and how businesses can develop and that, that we are also acknowledgement, right, or, we are, or that we acknowledge the diversity of these farmers. And, and again, this is where digital tools, you know, can help, you know, to, to provide farmers more context specific, right, uh, ecology wise, but also resource farm wise, you know, ambition wise, uh, a recommendation that is relevant, you know, to, to their needs and their resources. I'll stop there. Thanks, Jean. Thank you, thank you, Pete. Uh, so, I, co conscious of time, I think that that we are already uh, three minutes over. But I still want to give the last one minute to to Clement for your last point on this question before we move to the next part of the dialogue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll try to be uh, quick. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I want to say that farmers are very knowledgeable about their farming systems. We've seen that. We've heard that. And if they do not adopt what we call good practices, there is a good reason for that. And they, they usually do a lot of trials and errors and innovate and transition. And that's why there is a lot of diverse system now in Central Highlands. It's a lot harder to do when you talk about shade trees, when you talk about doing trials and errors, when you need to wait 20 years to get the results. So for that, we, we do need some basic research. And uh, as researchers, we do like trials, uh, we do measurements, we do modeling to answer these, uh, these questions and bring them the, uh, the answers. Uh, but at the same time, I would also argue that if farmers don't adopt good practices, uh, there is a knowledge gap also among researchers, among uh, extension services. And I would say that our, our um, advice are probably not relevant enough. Uh, not probably specific enough or tailored. And we should also learn from the farmers themselves. Mm. Uh, they have a wealth of experiences. Some farmers have already a first hand experience uh, intercropping coffee and avocado, and some others coffee and durian, and some others coffee and pepper. And if we can combine uh, and aggregate this farmer knowledge, we will be able to, um, to really build up on, on this, uh, this local knowledge and um, identify better, like more specifically the barriers. And then we can come back uh, to them with, I would say, more relevant solutions that will be also more easily adapted. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Clement. I really like the two-way learnings that you just mentioned uh, from ourselves to the farmers, but also back uh, from the farmers to us. So thanks a lot, uh, the, the three speakers uh, with a very informative and very rich um, uh, dialogue that we have today on intercropping uh, strategies, which I am sure that we have quite many questions that we cannot answer. But uh, possibly after this call, uh, you, we will reach out with, uh, with, with, uh, with the respondents so that we can respond to them later. So now I'd like to hand uh, over back to Christy uh, for your continuation. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chi thank you, and Didier, Dave and Piet. Uh, great conversation. Sorry to cut it off, but we have uh, a couple of uh, guests with us that I wanna make sure we have time for today. Uh, we've invited Mr. Echo Pranom Owidi, uh, Senior Advisor with Classic Beans Cooperative Indonesia, and Ms. Charlotte Jibu, the Sustainability Coordinator for Coffee for Asia and Africa with Louis Dreyfus Company, uh, to offer some of their just thoughts and reactions to what they've heard today. And, and it's been an incredibly rich conversation, so I don't envy either of you right now. Um, but first, I think I'll ask Echo first. Um, you have about five minutes, and I think we can kind of wrap this up uh, on schedule. Um, what are your three takeaways, three key takeaways, Echo? Uh, what resonated with you today? What do you think the coffee sector should be doing or going in terms of soil management, intercropping, um, especially uh, applied to uh, Indonesia, uh, which is where I know you're based? Um, thank you, Christy. Um, sorry. Um, with our experience, uh, we've been 12 years. Uh, to working together in the classic bean cooperatives to support agroforestry because we believe that regenerative farming we do in the past the whole humans do regenerative farming so the entry to do that is only to plant the coffee with the agroforest systems that's it we only need to understand that the value is not only the adding value of uh, nominal, like if we plant the vanillas or if we plant the peppers, but the adding value of us in our place is how we can create the microclimate, how we can create the water and sustain the water for us for let's see the next 20, 25 years. So what we see is before our culture and I, we believe in the, in the world, uh, everything is cyclist. The carbon is cyclist, the water also. Um, and that's what we believe. We are not believes on the, um, on the like a, like a straight line that there is a zero and then one, two, three, four, six. We don't believe on the linears, on the farming. We believe on cycles. And we need to do it together with farmers. We cannot do it ourselves. And uh, the last is we need to understand the culture, the anthropology, the history, of the, our own tribes. Then we share and we talk together to build the, the agroforestry. Things like that. Thank you. Thank you so I, much. I answer a lot of questions on the key and A. Um, I saw that. Then, Thank you yeah. for doing that too. There were so many questions today. Yep. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna then Charlotte. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, your sort of top three takeaways. Um, what resonated with you today? Um, what did you hear that made sense, or that you feel is important to kind of re-emphasize uh, for our audience today? Thanks, thanks a lot, Christy, um, and thanks for GCP, um, actually USID, for inviting us to speak. Uh, also, uh, thanks a lot to all the participants because uh, uh, we had very insightful contributions around the topic. Um, so I have little time, but um, yeah, uh, one of my main takeaways from this discussion today, um, I will try to um, explain now. First, I would say production of low carbon coffee is, I think, an opportunity. 
an opportunity to rethink the way we are farming coffee, uh, especially taking into account that um, most of the coffee farmers are smallholders um, in Asia, but uh, all over the world. And putting this into the context of where I am today in Indonesia, uh, the development of this kind of production system represents a lot of benefits uh, because of their um, small scale. Um, farmers here want to maximize the land they have available for their production to get most of the benefits from, uh, from, from this production in terms of income. And some of the solutions we have been discussing today, like sequestrating carbon through um, yeah, and diversification in terms of strategy into the coffee farms uh, via intercropping or agroforestry systems are a um, good strategy to optimize farmers' business. Uh, planting new crops um, and harvest them complement the revenue. So uh, we were talking about resilience in terms of um, economic resilience, but also in terms of environmental benefits. I think sequestrating is uh, based on the conversation and uh, insightful uh, contribution of our panelists, uh, a, a, key, a key solution. Um, at the same time, so we are regenerating the direct, direct environment of the smolders and also um, their, their income. Uh, it's something we have been able to observe at LDC uh, in Indonesia, but also in Vietnam. And um, after like five years of implementation of, of such a strategy with small orders in, in both countries, uh, we are harvesting the first actually products from the trees we have been planting with farmers, but also some of the key lessons um, to continue uh, this kind of intervention. And uh, I think uh, one is key, and I've been also mentioned uh, earlier by, uh, by one of the panelists, it's what we do also with, uh, with these crops. Uh, we are uh, incentivizing to, uh, to produce at the farm level, this avocado that will uh, arrive on the market. We need also to, to make sure that this, these crops we are pro promoting to, to small orders are actually viable for them, for suitable to their land, but also suitable for the market that they will receive uh, this, uh, this additional uh, products. It's, uh, it's very key. And I think it's, um, it's leading to, this point is leading to my second takeaway um, because producing this low carbon uh, brings of course benefits, but also um, some hard challenges. Uh, challenges that we need to consider integrate. Uh, we need uh, we need solutions, uh, a portfolio of solution to apply. Uh, but this is transformative for small orders, and change implies risk, uh, especially at the beginning of this uh, such a transition from one model to another. This implies additional costs, additional efforts. And um, as coffee supply chain stakeholders, uh, our role, uh, especially in the business uh, with, uh, with our peers, uh, but also customers, uh, I know they are already very committed to this question, but our role is I think also to um, enabling concretely now this change on the ground and minimizing the, this, this risk, uh, directly linking with farmers because some of these good solution we have been talking to uh, about today, um, we need to share uh, about them, but also share the um, in the, in a good way uh, the the right knowledge in order to minimize and save time to farmers because they do not have this time. Uh, I think uh, the climate change is not also um, giving us that much time, so it's uh, among us and. Uh, uh, linking with farmer that we need to, to solve uh, this, uh, this issue and equipping, of course, them with the right knowledge, but also the right inputs. Uh, we were talking about Bioshare is very key. We need to learn more about these innovative solutions and then find ways to uh, apply them in a collaborative way. Um, but finally, incentivizing this change is a cost for all, all stakeholders within the supply chain. And um, it's multi benefits, but also uh, it requires additional costs that we need to share. And I think it is the only way uh, we can make viable this transition from uh, uh, our current kind of conventional production coffee system to a regenerative one. So um, I think this conversation we had today is a, is a really good start because we can see that uh, all of the participants are very committed and uh, actually most of the participants are already uh, somehow uh, also demonstrated the interest to collaborate together in a 
pre-competitive way in uh, in Vietnam, but also in Indonesia. So I'm just looking forward to to see uh, concrete actions uh, being implemented on the ground. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Charlotte, and also thank you, Echo, for these kind of final thoughts. I really appreciate the time today. So that brings us to the end of our agenda uh, today. Uh, before we go, I want to um, kind of, well, let me say, we heard so many approaches and I really appreciate the, the summary at the end. Um, as I said, one of the goals of this event was to raise awareness um, and start the process of building capacity to address the sustainability challenges posed by climate change. Um, but also to provide this platform. Uh, and so we have a quick poll that I'd like to launch um, basically to see, you know, did we reach that goal today? Uh, we have a very short opinion poll here in Zoom. Um, once you answer the couple of questions and I can kind of keep talking while you do that, you can just answer here and then uh, end the poll, it, it will record live. So it's a sort of like a immediate feedback for, for us as the organizers um, today. And, and so certainly appreciate that. And um, before we, we close today, certainly if you have any recommendations, suggestions, or would like to be considered as a panelist on a future session, you have something to say, um, please do feel free to reach out to myself uh, to, uh, or, or to GCP, um, and we'd be happy to uh, hear that feedback um, so that we can make these series as useful uh, to you as possible. Um, and as a reminder, we will be having our next session uh, on, on currently scheduled for February 10th in 2022, uh, so next year. Uh, and we plan as a topic to explore climate finance and the coffee sector. So we'll give it a couple more minutes here just for people to uh, sign in uh, and, and answer the poll. And uh, certainly once you've done that, please feel free to, to sign off. I see a lot of people say, saying thank yous, which is great. Um, and we really appreciate your time today, especially you know those of you. We, I think at, at the top, we had about, I saw about 175 uh, participants logged on, um, which is great. Um, and for those who are interested in the materials today, the recording, the presentations, uh, we will make uh, those available. Um, through our uh, LinkedIn page um, for Green Invest Asia. And uh, since you registered for this event, we'll also be able to send it to you directly. Um, so you should see that in your inbox um, in uh, a couple days time. Great. So I'm gonna, I don't know if we can, we can close the poll, we can close the shop. Um, and say uh, so long and thank you very much. And we'll see you all back in February. Have a good end of the year holidays. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, uh, enjoy the time with your family and friends. Thank you so much.